Okay, webinar is being recorded. Yes, wonderful. Well, welcome everyone. I'm so excited to have you all here today. I think you're going to find this is a very, very, very informative uh, webinar. This is a subject that has always eluded me, but Rick, but Ray has actually helped illuminate me. I have to watch it a couple of times, but numbers are not my thing. Although last week I taught an amazing webinar on Excel. How is it that numbers are not my thing, but I love, love, love Excel. So I don't know, that's one of the mysteries of life. But today we're gonna to talk about understanding financial statements and sustainability. In other words, how do you find out if you're making money? And today's presenter is Ray Vix. And by the way, I'm Diane McKeever. I am the education chair of the Minnesota chapter of SCORE. What is SCORE? Well, SCORE is a nationwide nonprofit organization that is a resource partner of the Small Business Administration. We provide small businesses with free, absolutely free, never a charge, confidential business mentoring. Our particular chapter, the Minnesota chapter, which is part of Manatee and Sarasota counties, has over 90 volunteers standing by waiting to help you. Our chapter was last year recognized as a district chapter of the year. What, what part of your business can we help you with? Well, we can help you at the very beginning when you're just researching it or planning it, or you've just opened it and you need some more help, or you want to grow your business, or lastly, you're thinking about selling or closing your business. We actually have a team that specializes in that aspect of, uh, of business. So consider applying for a mentor. Where would you go to do that? Well... How about at the minnesota.score.org webpage? There are two buttons to request a mentor. We want to make it easy for you. Or you can find a, a webinar or a workshop that you'd like to go to. We've got a great list coming up. I'm going to show you what's coming up in September in just a moment. You can locate recorded podcasts on there. All of the webinars that we have are automatically in the next day or two put up on our website. So you can see this or any other previous webinar or other resources in our library. We've got lots of templates and all kinds of documents to help you. I wanna thank our sponsors. You'll notice that many of them are banks. You'll find that if you're working with a SCORE mentor, they're a lot more open to giving you some money because they know that you're really taking this seriously and that you've got good direction. And thank you again to our community partners. So as I promised, I'm just going to give you a, a fast overview of what we've got coming up in September. Of course, Ray Vix, I couldn't even put all of his credentials in there. So I just said over 30 years CPA, work for big four, big CPA for the big four CPA for firms. Uh, next week, QuickBooks, why you need a bookkeeping system. That's going to feed right into Ray's presentation, right? Where do you get these numbers from? Well, if you have a bookkeeping system, it's a, a big help to do that. Pamela Starr is back. She is a Grow with Google presenter, and she's going to present on making your work website work for you. Then we're going to have two very interesting nonprofit presentations, and they're being given by Ron Rod Houston from our Phoenix score chapter. And then we have Ken Countess. If you know anything about Constant Contact, you know Ken Countess. He is a professional presenter for them, and his topic is getting more opens with a great subject line. What makes a great subject line? So I've already I've already taken half of your time away, Ray, and I apologize for that. But today's presenter is Ray Vix. You can see here over 30 years experience uh, at big four CPA firms, three years as a CFO in Washington, extensive business experience in accounting, financial reporting, oh, sole pri proprietor at an LLC, three boards, I, I, it goes on and on and on. Licensed in many states, CPA licensed in many states. That's important too. So without further ado, Ray, I am turning it over to you. Great. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about financial statements and sustainability. So we want to keep the energy up. So I'm going to try to keep the same energy level that Diane <laughs> opened uh, with and, 
And, and maybe the best way to do that is to answer this question, am I making money, right? I mean, that's the bottom line of when we talk about financial statements. So we'll, let's try, we'll try to keep, it, keep that in context. So on, on, on this next slide, um, I, I like to start with the question of why should you even care, right? I mean, you're, you know, you, you've got a business, you're, you know, you're, you're, um, you know, you, you guys are taking uh, the risk. So, you know, these financial statements, they're historical, right? They're, they're, they're not necessarily about the future, they're about the past, but they're even important enough to warrant your attention and your focus. I, another question I like to ask is, let's assume they are, then how, what, what's your familiarity level as a business owner in terms of financial reporting? When you think about the terminology, you know, are you a financial expert? Do you, do you feel you're a financial expert with respect to your specific business? And that's really the important question, right? Could, could you speak to the financial health of your business right now at the current moment? I mean, could, could you talk to it? So when we get past, you know, the uh, just regular thought, how's the business doing really, right? And that's a question I think as an owner that you probably ask. So, so moving to um, the next uh, slide, the, you, I mean, I, I say, I mean, okay, so the slide, right, leads in with know your financial status, right, show me the money, et cetera, where it came from, where it went, where it is now. So to do that, a lot of people talk about the language of business, financial reporting, the terminology. Why is, why is, that, why is that even important to you as an owner? Well, your performance as an owner is reported in your financial statement. So, I mean, that's, that's where the story is told. Uh, your banker, your partners, your fellow investors, maybe even some of your key suppliers, they're all gonna measure your success uh, based on examining what's in your financial statements. Uh, so, uh, so it's critical from that standpoint. Uh, and, and also, I mean, this, this concept of the language of business, you know, you, you hear terminology, the buck stops here, right? It, it, this is about your money. Uh, the, the, when, when the day's over, in addition to accomplishing goals that you have in life, right? This, this business needs to uh, produce profitability for you. In order, I think, personally, to do that, it is important to understand and speak that language. So, on our next slide, we ask the question, and what are financial statements, right? They're the report cards. When the day's over about a business, they portray the activities. What we're going to do is dive in a little bit here to begin to gain an understanding of the basics of these financial statements. But then most important to me, at least, as a uh, SCORE uh, mentor is that they become strategic business tools for you. As owners and managers of businesses, these financial statements are not of value unless they're tools that you can use to more effectively run the business. So, so let, let's dive right into these now. Um, so what do financial statements show? Okay, we, we accountants say there are three basic financial statements as defined. The first, the, these are, and, and what you see on your screen is not necessarily in the order an accountant thinks, but it's, but that's okay. All right, so three basic financial statements. Number one is the balance sheet, or also called the statement of financial position. Number two is the income statement, which is listed first here. Probably for a business owner, that's more important than the balance sheet, right? The income statement. And then the third is what we call a statement of cash flows. We're, we're going to get into each of these a little bit later. There, there is a fourth statement. I know you're thinking he's talking about three basic and I see four, all right? So there's also a statement of changes in equity. It, you, you, you will see this at times, but often it's collapsed and is either part of an income statement or part of a balance sheet. 
And that's why we accountants don't think of it as one of the three basics because it's embedded, but you can see it separately from time to time. And we will show an example as we go. Okay, so let, let's go ahead and start with the income statement. People call it the P&L. I think the most important thing to think about for an income statement is that it looks at your performance for a specific period of time, whether that be a month, a quarter, a year, et cetera. And, um, you know, I think um, if, if, if you think about this, th this you, you probably get familiar with an income statement even prior to having operations because you're probably gonna start out by doing financial projections about the business. Then you're going to do budgets. And then ultimately, once you have operations, then you're going to have an income statement. So you, you, you guys are probably much more familiar with an income statement than you may give yourself credit for at this time, particularly if you already have a business that you, even if you, even if you recently started it. So, but, this, this is the statement that answers the question, am I making money or not? When the day's over, we're gonna look at the cash flow statement, but this is what it's about. This is where profitability is measured. So we have a little sample income statement here. The print is kind of um, a small, but I, I just wanna point out a couple of things that I think about when I see this. And it may be, it may be a way to think about income statement. So uh, it's not so much the numbers that I'm looking at as the relationships between the numbers within the statement. And then what this statement says about the underlying company or the business, right? So I look at this and I say, all right, this is a manufacturing company probably. Why? Because it's selling some type of product to customers. And the reason I say that is because look, look at this, the, the section right after sales. It says cost of goods sold, right? And then you see materials, labor, and overhead immediately in there. Th those, are, those are clearly uh, uh, the types of costs that have to do with the activities of producing a product. Now, another thing I look at is I say, okay, the materials cost is by far the largest of those costs of producing the product, 200,000, right? Out of the 322. So then I say, all right, this is a company that probably has a partially finished materials that it acquires. And then it finishes those up through the labor and the overhead. So, so again, it's not so much the number as how it fits the other numbers that's giving you some insight into the business. If, if you look at the next group of items, which we call the SG&A expenses, okay, uh, those are selling general and administrative. That's what SG&A means. Um, these have a variety of types of costs. Some are fixed. So, some are sub, more subject to management than others, et cetera. Bottom line to think about here, though, is this is usually where an owner can most directly control the business. So to the extent the owner can manage these SG&A expenses, it usually directly impacts the profitability. Here's a business then that generated a pre-tax income of 62 and change. From a percentage standpoint, that's 12.6%. The, the company appears to have an effective tax rate of 25%. And that's just a relationship between the 15 and the 62. So I look and I say, okay, that's, that's reasonable. It, it's net income percentage is 9.4%. So overall, I say, okay, a company in the manufacturing environment that's getting 9 to 10% to the bottom line, seems to me they're doing okay. But so, so that's, that's working your way through the statement and getting a sense of it. Balance sheet now. So what's a balance sheet? Okay, so, so if, if, a, if, a, if the income statement is over a period of time, the balance sheet's a snapshot. Right? It's at a point in time. It's, you know, it's, not, it, it's not a moving picture, if you will, right? It's where we stand today. And you know, balance sheets have assets, 
which of the things you you own as a business, but they have to be paid for. And that's typically where liabilities are going to come into play, owner's investment's going to come into play, and also the results of your operations. So this is what we call the accounting equation here. It's the, it's the basis for the accounting model. Assets equal liabilities plus equity. But I always say, what, what does that really mean? It means I need to acquire assets to run a business and generate profits. How do I acquire assets? Either I put equity in or I borrow money. So essentially that's the equation, but it's still a closed equation. And, and because of that, it allows for predictable relationships among these. We're gonna come back to that when we start talking about looking at um, performance indicators. Okay. All right, so now we have a sample balance sheet again, apologize for the small uh, print, uh, but just, just a couple quick things here. Again, we're, we're, we're going to look at this for meaning as opposed to the numbers themselves. So the first thing you notice, remember we said it's a balanced equation. So at the very bottom, the total assets are 351, but notice so are total liabilities and capital. Those have to agree to one another. It's a balance sheet, right? So that then it's in balance. All right, so now what elements would, let's say a banker is looking at these and they're trying to get a sense of your business. One thing they're gonna look at are current assets. So if you go up on the left-hand side, about a third of the way up, total current assets are 96,000. Now, if you go straight across, look at your current liabilities. They're about 35,000, okay? So a banker would say, hmm, the, the company's in a good liquidity position. It has almost three times as many current assets that it could turn into cash as it has current liabilities that have to be paid in cash. So that's gonna make a banker somewhat comfortable. But let's, let's look at this business a little bit further. We mentioned it's probably a manufacturing business. Th this is what I call a capital intensive company because if you look, look at total fixed assets, which is about a third, uh, yes. Uh, two, notice how that's 250,000 of the total 351 in assets. So th this is clearly then a business that a lot of its capital is going to be tied up in things like equipment, buildings. Uh, and of course that makes sense because we said it's a manufacturing company, right? It's not a services company. So I look at this and I say, all right, they, they've got 250,000 of fixed assets. How'd they get them? What'd they use? Well, I go over to my debt. See my total, see my long-term debt? I've got 15, thousand in long-term debt. I've got mortgages for another 115. That's also a longer term debt. Uh, up above, there's something that says CPLTD. That's the current portion of debt. The, when you put those all together, the total long-term finance, and I did my math, it's 133,000 if you put those three lines together. And they bought fixed assets of 250. So what they did is they used some leverage, but they didn't go overboard with leverage, right? There's clearly some owner's equity in the business too. And that takes us down to the equity section where you see the owners invested about 100,000, right? It, it has generated though assets in the range of 350,000 with a good use of debt and the company's also profitable. And if you look, you can see, not only do you see the net income of the 47 for this year that we saw earlier, you also see they have retained earnings of 39,000 right above there. So that means the business has been generating profits in the past too. Okay, so that's, that's how you would look at this balance sheet. Let's go to the uh, uh, statement of changes in equity. As I mentioned, it, it I mean, it, you don't always see it, okay? But here's the key thing is, as an owner, it's very important, right? Because what this really does is gives you a sense of, for the money you're investing and for the, uh, uh, for the profit you're generating, right? How, are, are you able to 
provide yourself with a return on your investment that meets your goals, right? I mean, if if the company is returning 10% on your investment, you're probably pretty pleased with it. If it's returning 1%, could, could you do better with your investment elsewhere, even as a passive investor, right? So at some point, I think the statement of changes in equity is important in that it just gives you a sense of the deployment of your equity and what you're getting for it. So, so here's a sample then on the next page of a statement of changes in equity, if, if it were separately presented. And, you know, the, the key thing is if you look halfway down the page where it says net income for the year, okay, this is coming out of our P&L statement that we saw earlier. So that shows you how this year's operations performed. And there's nothing else happening in equity in this year, in this 2015 sample year, because there are no withdrawals from the company, right? Because that's showing zero, no dividends. We didn't have any accounting corrections to make. So essentially, all this is doing is rolling forward last year's equity to this year. So total equity last year was 139. Now it's 186. And the difference is the net income. Okay, because that's the only activity that happened in equity. Okay. Statement of cash flows. Okay, so what this gets into are what we call inflows and outflows of cash, but it puts it into three key buckets or it's from three sources, operating activities, financing, and investing. Now, you know, obviously operating activities, that's self-explanatory, right? Revenues minus expenses on a cash basis, right? So that, I think that's straightforward. Financing activities, this, this again gets to the question of leverage is that, does it make sense to borrow to acquire assets to use to generate operating profit? And then your investing activities has to do with using cash you have for other than operations. So let's say you have excess cash. What do you want to invest it in? Property, uh, investments, et cetera. Okay, so that's what, th this, is, this is a very good statement because it gives you a sense of your liquidity. And, and also it, it helps you get a sense of the quality of your liquidity. So in other words, if you've got a lot of cash because you just borrowed significant cash at a fairly high interest rate, that, that's not necessarily good news, right? Right. So it, this also gives you a sense of the quality of cash, where did it come from, and, and how efficiently was it derived? So let's, let's walk through this quickly. Um, you know, we, there's, our, there's our net. We start at the top with the net earnings. You know, that keeps coming back, right, the net income. Um, now, you know, anytime you are doing a statement of cash flows to get cash from operations, there are certain accounting adjustments you have to make. Long story short here is our cash from operations halfway through the page is 49,000. If we looked at our income statement, it would show 47. And the difference is just the timing. It's the timing of when we collect our receivables and make our payments, et cetera. But you can see that difference is not significant. So we generate this company, this is a good, healthy company. It generated 49,000 cash from its operations. Now, that, in my view, that freed them up to be able to say, you know what, um, we, we need to invest in equipment and in a building this year. However, we, 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 can, we can go to financing sources and do that because you can put those buildings and equipment up as collateral. And if you will, we can hold on to our cash and just roll it forward from year to year. So, so as a result, they really financed their investments they made using debt and really didn't have to use uh, any of the cash from operations. Okay, all right. So those, uh, I'll pause and take a breath. So that what that what we've done is very quickly, and we, and we'll 
we'll take some time for Q&A. I want to get through this quickly so we could have Q&A time. Um, but, but, I, but, but now I do want to talk about financial performance ratios. Uh, some people refer to these as key performance indicators or KPIs. You'll hear various terminology. Th this, to, to me, th th this is where now your understanding of your financial financial statements can pay off for you, right? This is what I call the no pain, no gain formula. Is that, you know, the, so, so if you will, the pain is in understanding the financial statements and the terminology, but there are benefits. There, there are gains to be derived from how you use them. And that's the space that we, we're going into now. When we start talking about performance ratios, these are tools that a savvy owner is going to use to run the business. So let's, let's, take, let's take some of these. You see the list there. We'll, we'll take a few of them and just talk a little bit about it. A, an important ratio that you will see is cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales, right? This has to do with, let's say you're in a manufacturing operation, how efficiently do you produce your product? Because to the extent you produce it efficiently, then this percentage is going to be in a range that makes sense to you. Now, the where do you get that? I mean, so typically you're going to research industry averages. You're going to think about size of a company, what sector it plays in, right? Uh, what market it plays in, and you're going to be able to get some, uh, you, you, you can get some industry average information. And so let's just say if this company happens to be in an industry where the average is 70%, cost of sales to sales, then they're doing better than the average because they're at 64 and a half percent. The other, so, so that's comparing it to the industry. So you have a benchmark. What may be even more important is comparing to yourself periodically, right? How does it compare to last month, last quarter, last year? Are you becoming more efficient? Or are, 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 is the cost of producing your inventory rising or falling relative to your sales? All right. So th there, are, there are tons of uh, things that you can uh, get out of this. I think the key thing, though, is that use this as an early, you know, so the, the early warning system, right? Indicator of maybe changes that need to occur. So you, you, it, it allows you to get in front of potential issues. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Gross profit to sales. We won't spend too much time on this. This is the flip side of that equation we just looked at. I mean, this is that there's there's kind of a, um, a reciprocal relationship here, right? Is that if you add these two ratios up, it's going to equal 100% just because of the math. But likewise, this is also a good thing to um, have your thoughts around is that there, there should be a benchmark on gross profit, but it does measure the same thing as the previous ratio. So you could use either. I mean, I, I don't know if you need both, but it measures the same thing is that how efficiently do you produce your sales is what a gross profit ratio is about. And again, it's an early indicator. Okay. We talked about SG&A expenses earlier. I, and again, in my view, I think these costs are usually more controllable than the cost of sales, right? Be, because the, the, to a great degree, this is about owner choices on how the owner wants to do business. And so you can control them more, okay? To the extent you do, it immediately impacts profit because these fall right to that bottom line uh, margin. Remember, we were talking about these guys at about 9.4%. Well, right here, they're at 23%, right? If that were instead, let's say 20%, there would be a direct and proximate impact on the 9.4% that's their profit margin, right? So I think this is important. I, I think 
I think this this is one of those where sure you want to look at industry averages and benchmark it, but I think also as a an owner who's also a manager, you want to at some point say, here's where I want to be there. And and then you drive the business to that to that um to that number. Okay, so um we we talked about this some, um, you know, I mean when the day's over, right? This is your bottom line, right? So they're running at 9.4% of sales uh, after tax, right? So, and, you know, that's, that's probably pretty good. There are businesses where maybe that would be higher, like maybe some of the high tech, tech type companies, it would be higher. There are businesses where it would be lower, but if it, th this is a manufacturing company running about 9.4%, that's probably pretty good. Obviously, the question would be, what do you want it to be? And what do you expect it to be? And you would continue to drive the business uh, based on the expectations you have. All right. So that was just a quick discussion of some of these performance indicators. A couple of times I mentioned industry standards. So here, here you know, here are some places you could go. And I think you use the SIC codes or the uh, standard industry classification codes to get your industry. And then th this is actually a place I, I went in here just to see what this would look like. You, you, you basically go to the website uh, for the um, library and you, you, you can just type in the search for the uh, uh, intellect, the emergent intellect tool and you know, when you log in, et cetera, you can, you, you can sign up, open an account. I don't, I, th I don't think there's any cost. And then you can go down on the different, you know, you're gonna find, you, you're gonna know the SIC code for your industry. You can go to that and you can select it. And then you can begin to look at some things. I haven't, I keep saying, I'm going to spend some more time with this. And you know, I, I have to admit, I haven't, since uh, last year when we uh, last talked about it, but this is one of, I'm sure, many tools you can use to benchmark. And that's, that's why we have it in here. Um, on the next page, you know, th this, this, is a, this is a nice resource book. You can see we have a number, as Diane mentioned, you know, when you, if you go to our website, we, we, we've got more than you could ever possibly need. And you can and you can get to most of these things with just a search. You put in a couple keywords and it'll take you right there. I've done it myself. I, you know, it, it, it's interesting because we talk about this as being an excellent resource book for those already in business. It uh, even though it says start your own business, but it's also a wonderful resource for mentors, right? Because it's not like the mentors know the answers as much as they're finding them out as they go uh, along with the um, client. So I think that that pretty much wraps up any comments. I mean, we're open for any Q&A and Diane, you let us know how much time we have. We're, we're here for the duration. We are great on time. We have plenty of time to answer questions. Uh, we just don't have any open questions. Apparently, you were outstanding and <laughs> explained everything in such a way. Uh -oh. uh, will uh -oh. you get a copy of the slide, Sheena is asking. And the answer to that is not only are you going to get a copy of these slides, but you are going to get a copy of this entire video because I did remember to hit record early on. So you are going to get that. Um, we have Oswald is asking, uh, uh, so let me finish my thought. You're going to get a copy of the video and you're going to get a copy of the slides and that will be in your email in the next couple of days. But Oswald wants to know, do you have a sample pro forma to evaluate and forecast a business? So, and Diane, also I see under, there are questions being asked yep. under chat also. And I see that, thank you. Okay. okay. So, so I'm sorry. So the, the question was, what was the question? The question was, do you have a sample pro forma to evaluate and forecast a business? We, we have a couple templates that we use, but when you say to evaluate and forecast, I'm going to, um, 
I'm going to say yes. I mean, so in other words, we 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 have templates where yeah. essentially you're going to fill in information with your assumptions about your business, and 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 then essentially you can run these different types of statements and reports, including a forecast that we talked about. Now, now, should is there information that you can take to compare that specifically to businesses like yours? Pro 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 probably not readily sitting there, but the benchmarking process is not as difficult as it used to be in my view, because of um, services like the one I mentioned through the library. And then also, I mean, now you could just Google, I mean, I Google everything now, but I gotta be honest, right? I'll go in and I'll say, what's the, typical uh, profit margin for a healthcare consulting business of a size less than a million. You can put that specific a question in and you actually will get hits that'll take yep. you uh, to places where you can find it. So that, that's probably the best way to go with that. And do go to our website, minnesota.score.org, and uh, in the search box, put in templates, put in financial templates, put in P&L templates. We've got a ton of them, and I often will point to my clients there because, um, you know, they should know that we have great resources. Jim is asking, I have a SAAS business. How is that different? Software as a service? Yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't would like to. Okay, I shouldn't read. I shouldn't read this. You I shouldn't should, read. I, I, I should just respond. Okay, so I have a SaaS business. How's it different? Cost? I have no material overhead, but we pay for right. Okay, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes. Now that's going to. It's interesting because. Uh, software as a service, if you will, has attributes of both a product and a services business, right? So you, your, your cost of your sales is going to be an interesting proposition. Like if you were a pure play services business, let's say you're a consulting firm, right? What's your cost of sales if you're a consulting firm? You certainly don't have any materials. You, you could argue perhaps that you have some labor and overhead. You could argue that maybe you have a, uh, 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 you know, practice development or sales element to drive the business that should be captured there. But when the day is over, you essentially don't have a cost of sales component in your income statement. And I think if you, if you went, you, you can also pull up various sample uh, income statements for different industries. And what you would find is that most services industries really do not have a cost of sales section in their income statement because it's almost not applicable. Mm -hmm. Software as a service is a little bit different because there is some element of selling a product, which is software. And so I think to the extent you acquire software that you then maybe either you tweak it and then sell it. You could then I have it has to, to be, yeah. you need a developer to help you. I mean, there are some yes. costs associated. Yes, you yeah, you, so you, I mean, you could have cost of goods sold with software as a service to the extent you're acquiring software that then you're going to further tweak and sell. I, I hope that uh, all of you, please put your questions in the q and I'm looking at those first and then the chat second. So if you want your question answered early, uh, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, uh, Scott wants to know, why is depreciation treated as cash? Isn't depreciation associated with the useful lifetime of a tool, like a tool that needs to be replaced after it's used up? Well, depreciation, if you, in, in an income statement, depreciation is just a regular expense, you're right? It's an operating expense and you're right, it's, it's incurred ratably. So it's incurred because you use some equipment, let's say, and you, you give it a useful life. So you say, well, it has a useful life of five years and in each year I take one fifth of the cost of that into depreciation as an expense. Now, the next question is, 
from a cash standpoint, what does that mean? If you are converting to your, in, in a statement of cash flows, to your cash from operating activities, you would add that depreciation expense back for that period because it did not involve the use of cash. Because you, you used the cash when you first bought, let's say, that, that auto for, you know, 50, uh, a thousand, and now you're taking depreciation expense of ten thousand each year. If if you're converting your income statement to a cash basis income statement, you have to add the ten thousand back because it's non-cash in that period. So that that's a story with depreciation, but it is for 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 an accountant and in an income statement, it's an expense, even though it doesn't involve the ongoing and current use of cash. Uh, Vanessa wants to know, do you have any thoughts on the profit first type of accounting? You mean profit as an objective first or? Profit first in quotation marks. Let's see if Vanessa describes Vanessa? it. Yeah, any yeah. further you know what i can do is uh i can uh, let vanessa talk how's that let me see That'd if i can great. find vanessa here this to you vanessa okay vanessa uh if you Hi, vanessa. Yourself. Vanessa. um profit first is a type of accounting that the best way i can understand it is basically budget before you spend the money so they say that you take uh, your income and uh, pay yourself first and then divide the rest of the money into what you need to spend it for. So that um, basically what they would say is if there's not enough money to pay yourself and to pay your expenses, then you're not okay. And so basically take a percentage of the profit, the gross profit, pay yourself take what's left and figure out how much can I spend on overhead employees, et cetera. So it's a, it's a different way of looking at it. Yeah. I, and, and I think it's a fair way to think about it, Vanessa, right? And what we're talking about here really are your projections and your budgeting, et cetera, as opposed to your after the fact financial statements, right? Because this is really making decisions then about where you're going to spend. And, and that's always going to be in the context of, well, how much revenue are you generating to spend, right? So right. You're, it, it's still a projection budgeting exercise where <laughs> in, in that case, what essentially what you're saying or what's being said is that you're both an owner and an operator. Right. Most small business owners are both. And so you have to also compensate the operator. And then you and then you return, you give a return to the investor. So an owner is an investor and a manager slash operator. The, the manager gets compensated, the investor gets a return on their investment, right? So 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 that so I mean I, I, I like the concept that says to if the business is going to be sustainable, then the the part of me, the owner that is the manager needs to receive fair compensation. If, if not, it's not sustainable. Uh, but in, in addition to that, I'm also an owner and I need to receive a fair return on my invested money and time, right? So then, so once, I, once, once, once I'm sure I can sustain the business with my uh, compensation, then I can make decisions about where else do I want to spend money with the objective being that I'm spending it to, 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 to earn a return for myself as an owner, unless you have other investors too. They, they'd be very right. interested in those questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, Skip is saying in your illustration, you have labor under cost of goods sold and salaries under expenses. Where is owner compensation? That's a good, that's a good one. And, and, and honestly, I would say that it depends on where the owner plays in the business, right? It is the owner part of the, so when you see labor in a cost of goods sold section, let, let's, let's say we're a manufacturer and we make cars. 
All right, labor there would be the people who make the cars, the vehicle, right? If you if you go further down that income statement under the SG&A section and you see salaries and labor, those are the people who administer, who sell, who market. They're, it, they're, so, so yes, they're all compensated and it's all labor costs, but it's, it, it serves different purposes in the context of the business. So if you're, if you're the owner and, and the owner is directly involved in the manufacturing process to the extent the owner is being paid wages, it should be picked up there in cost of sales. If the owners instead uh, involved uh, much more in the marketing, sales, overall administration of the business side, which is probably more the common case, then the owner's comp is typically picked up down below in SG&A labor. Okay, Sheena has a question. For consulting service companies, could we have recurring services that are labeled as unearned revenue? Would that be accurate? Unearned revenue. Yeah, un unearned revenue for an account, when an accountant hears that, we, we think of the liability side of the balance sheet. And, and here's a way to follow through the thinking. Unearned revenue typically means someone has paid you in advance. Mm. Because in other words, they've already paid you, but you haven't earned it yet because you haven't provided the service yet. Mm -hmm. So when do you see this? I mean, you know, businesses where there are retainers given, for example, right? Law firms will typically see this pretty often. Um, you could have companies who get large grants to do business where they're able to draw down money on the grant before they go and perform the service required by the grant. But the bottom line in this is that you have cash that you've gotten, so you have to make a debit, right? Remember how we said it has to balance? You got a debit cash because you've gotten cash. So the question is, what's your credit to offset it on earned revenue? Now, when you begin to perform the service, and now that revenue is yours to keep, if you will, you don't have to give it back because you're performing, then you can take that off your balance sheet and take it through your revenue as P&L. Because it's not revenue until after you perform the service that you agreed to. Okay, so it's it's kind of crazy. I mean, the, the way an accountant thinks about revenue is revenue is a performance. It, it results from a performance obligation, right? You go to someone and you say, I'll perform the following. And they say, okay, I'll pay you. Now you got a performance obligation. When you act on and successfully complete that obligation, then you have revenue. That, that's how accountants think. Uh, Shada is asking, uh, from where can we get benchmarking for a retail store business? I think that's that I, emergent uh, intellect that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would look there. And what I would find is what's the um, uh, SIC code, the SIC code mm -hmm. for retail. And it, and it may be more nuanced than that, right? Because, yeah. you know, there's all types of retail. So, but I would look at that. Yeah, we had a, uh, a wonderful webinar from the folks from Manatee Library, and they were talking about all about Mergent Intellect. That's their version of it. Sarasota Library has a different version, but I would encourage all of you to go to your local library, contact your local library. There's a business librarian there who, a reference librarian, who'd be more than happy to point you in the right direction. And as Ray said, uh, library cards are free, and you can often access these uh, databases from home remotely. That's true. Yes. Okay. Um, let me see. For small business that are at four years, what would be the most important measure you would recommend? Business is a behavioral health. For a small business that's, that's about four years, I guess, 
what would be the most important measures that you would recommend? Um, Amaryllis, I think I'm going to promote you uh, unless you uh, Ray have an idea what Amaryllis might be um, mm -hmm. referring to. So Amaryllis, if you would uh, unmute yourself. Hi, uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, um, thank you so much for all of this information. Um, so yeah, so I have uh, my business that's in behavioral health care um, and I'm just having a hard time with knowing exactly what would be like the best things to track for my business because I obviously did not go to school for financial things. Um, so if you could pick like the top three things that you would recommend that um, we just kind of look at. Um, it is a very, very small company. It's just me and three employees. So just trying to figure out with all of the information that you provided today, what would like, where, where would you start? Um, mm -hmm. now, are <laughs> thank you. you. You you you're a psychiatrist. You're um, in the, I'm a therapist. In the mm -hmm. Therapist, okay. So I would say, right? You know, and the reason I ask that is to get a sense of your revenue source, right? Mm -hmm. It's that, you know. So one thing I would track and have my my arms around fully is what's what are my typical sources of revenue? How 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 do I how is cash delivered to me for the service, right? Am I having to do it through health insurance companies? Is it more direct, directly from my, you know, clients or patients, et cetera? So I'd say number one is understanding absolutely the revenue cycle. How do you get from got a new client to cash, right? to make sure you have that as efficient as possible. Because number two, I was gonna say is, you're, you're still early enough where cash is king. Is that, um, right, Li liquidity is what it's about in the startup years. Is that as, as long as you have enough liquidity, then you probably also have access to borrowing in a, in a better way and you also have the ability to sustain market issues, right? Because you have cash. So that's what I'd say is second. And then I, I, I you know, um, third, I guess, would be to, um, you said like after three or four years, I'd be, you know, I'd, I'd start thinking about, okay, who am I, who are key competitors? Um, what are the threats? Because you you're if you had a three four year mark, you you've gotten through. I think the the very very difficult first couple of years. Now, how do you get yourself to a position of sustainability, right, uh, et cetera? And part of that is to think about who are my competitors, you know, who who might I partner with, you know, et cetera, where you can get more into growing the business and making it strong. Good. Thank you so much. <clears throat> oh, thanks. Um, so Lori is saying, um, I'd like to pull certain percentages and amounts of my monthly business performance into different bank accounts to prepare for future expenses. For example, a uh, taxes bank account and expenses bank account, et cetera. Do you have a recommended place to determine what percentages we should take for each category or how to determine excuse me, that percentage when we are starting out. It's the profit first business model I'm referring to. Okay. Yeah, one, I mean, one thing I would say is that I like, I like co-mingling cash. And then I, I'm, I'll elaborate a little bit, but I, I'm not a fan of a lot of bank accounts. I'm, I'm a fan of concentrations of cash because then you can put the cash to better work for you mm. from a cash management standpoint. So you you concentrate your cash and think think and and and, and then you and then you work with people who are experts there to maximize your cash and and having it work for you. Now there's a separate question, right? And then a separate question is, how do I track my obligations and, and coming expenditures around certain things like taxes, 
payroll, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that you rely on your bookkeeping systems for. Okay. So if you're using something like QuickBooks Office, et cetera, I mean, there are plenty of tools that you can, that you can use to, to both track and project what your expenses are gonna be and the timing of when they're due. But I'd separate that from my cash management because you only wanna draw down on the cash when you need to. And I think when you slice and dice your cash up into a number of accounts, I mean, I've got a couple of people ask me, should I use like five or six different banks? And I say, well, I mean, on one hand you say, well, it gives you some flexibility. At the same time, it takes away the ability to concentrate monies and be in a better position to negotiate with your bank. Okay. Natalie, uh, in this case, would I as the owner be compensated via a distribution for a corporation and would it be considered owner's return slash equity? Now with regard to me as the manager employee, would I be compensated via salary which is then considered an expense. Uh, is this something that you want to talk to Nathalie about? Or do you understand yeah. the question? Right. I think, I think I, so in other words, well, maybe, maybe I should get, maybe, maybe, maybe she could. Okay. Let's elaborate a little bit because in, in other words, yeah. I Okay. Go ahead, Natalie. Okay. Go ahead, Nathalie. Unmute yourself and give us your question again. Mm -hmm. Nathalie? Hello? Nathalie, you're unmuted. You're, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Well, I can. Why, okay. why I, started, I, I, I mean, I could respond based on what I think. Okay. The question is, I just won't, I don't know if I'm right on point, but, you know, the, with, with a small business, right, it, there's always a big, huge challenge. Let's say it's in an LLC form and there's a sole owner who also is the sole employee, if you will, or sole manager. It's not unusual for a startup, right? In that time frame and in that instance, how do you account for cash transactions with the owner, right? I mean, so when the owner writes a check to the business, your first thought is, okay, that's an owner's equity contribution to the business, right? It's not revenue because you can't sell product to yourself. So you say, all right, that's, that's then the only other thing it can be is owner's equity. Okay, now suppose the owner on a monthly basis writes a check to themselves. I mean, they have expenses that have to be defrayed, right? Again, the question is, is that salary or is that a return of equity, right? Or like if, 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 you, if you open, the, if you put a hundred grand into the business and then over 10 months, you took 10,000 out a month and there were no other activity, at some point it's back down to zero, were any of those revenue and expense transactions? Those are all of the questions that come into play when you have a single sole owner who's also the sole operator of the business and there are no other employees. It's, it's difficult. Uh, a lot of businesses have contract employees in the early years, right? So at least it's easy for them to track, even though it's not called salary, it's easy for them to, to, to track their contract labor, if you will. And so one of the things I've been recommending, honestly, to some of the clients is that there, there's no reason not to try to measure the compensation to yourself. What you do with it, though, it, it's worth having a conversation with a tax accountant. Okay. We which, have time. Which, oh, sorry. About 10 minutes, which, which I, and the reason I say that is because, which I'm, I'm not, like, I, I mean, I, I had to go find a tax accountant. All right. And, and the reason is because I have an LLC. 
All right. So, and the reason is, is that there is the complexity of tax law, right? So if you're paid a salary, you normally get a W-2, I think, from the company. But if you're an owner, don't you usually get a schedule, you get a K-1 schedule or a 1099 or a, it gets, it can get pretty complicated when you have monies going to owners who are also operators. And I think it's, I think you have tax questions and you should get like somebody who's a tax expert right. on these questions and make sure you talk to them to avoid potential trouble down the road. So we are at one o'clock. <clears throat> I think we have time for these two last questions because I think they're short. Uh, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> Elena said, if you have only three minutes to make decisions as to the company's performance, what are your key indicators that you would look at first, such as gross receipts or net income or three minutes, Ray, you only have three minutes to make a decision. <laughs> the, the first thing I look at are my receipts, right? I mean, right when the day's over, I'd look at my receipts. And then the second thing I'd look at are my controllable spends what 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 can i either spend money on today or not where it's my call i'd look at th those those would be my first two things i look at and then and the, and the third thing i'd look at is what's my liquidity position because cash is king in a small business mm -hmm. last question from donna is it smart to invest in the stock market as a business if the company has any uh, excess profits, thinking it would be done at the end of the year? Your thoughts? No, no. Mm. First of all, I'm not an investment advisor. So whatever I say, <laughs> it, it can't be. <laughs> uh, I would, um, that, that's, that's a, a good loaded question. question right now, isn't yeah, it? That's a, and it's a good one, right? Because, right, again, you let's say you have excess cash. The question is, how can you get your best return on it, right? And yep. is it the stock market? Is it to reinvest it in the business, et cetera? Is, is, it, is it to pay down debt? Maybe you have high interest debt. And it may make more sense to pay that debt down because if you've got 15% debt, can you can you get 15% from the stock market? Maybe. So, and maybe you can and may, right, right? So, but th those are the things I think about when trying to decide whether to invest in the stock market, I'd look, be, I'd look much more broadly than just there to decide what's the best way to spend my excess cash as a business. Wonderful. No great. open questions. I like to see that. Thank you. You did a great job, Ray. As usual, I, I thank you for filling in at the last minute and you did beautifully. And thank you for taking the time. I also want to thank our attendees and you will be getting a survey. I would like you, I would hope that you would fill in that survey because it'd be really great. We want to see what we can improve and what other subjects would like you'd like to see. As I said, I'm the education chair and you can make a difference by making some suggestions. So visit our website. We've got uh, there, you can apply for a mentor. You can see our podcasts. So thank you so much for attending. Thank you for uh, presenting Ray, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you. All I right. enjoyed it. Bye. Bye.